After meeting Reverend Long at the community center, he invited me to his home in a neighborhood called Henderson Hill, where he is one of the last remaining residents. I mean, there's a number of people in this community. No. Not anymore? No. Where did everyone go? Um, uh, died out and moved away. What are the, some of the things that people were dying of when they were mm, here? Cancer, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular diseases, um, uh, irritable airway diseases. The same things that you're yeah, suffering yeah, from yeah. currently? Mm -hmm. Hypertension. So this person over here moved? Uh, no, he passed away. About across the street. Uh, he passed away. Where's the closest living person to you? Well, they just moved down there this month, down at the end of the street. Anyone else on this road? No, just me. How about up that way? Yeah, there's some on the next street. But this used to be a live and thriving neighborhood. But since the contamination and PCB and that which has impacted this area is, is become a uh, dead town, dead community. So what does it feel like to be walking around in a community that used to be so thriving and now all of these homes uh, are empty? Mm, I feel hurt. I feel hurt. Hurt that uh, once we lived and enjoyed our neighborhood not knowing that it was contaminated with poison and didn't nobody tell us about it because they knew about it before we were told in 1995. They knew. After discussing his experience, Reverend Long offered to take me on a tour of the Bacon community that was once lively and thriving, beginning with the home of the Bowies who lived across the street from him. They stayed here and the majority of them, they died with uh, cancer. Miss Marthy Bowie and Tom Bowie and, and some of their sons, they had liver diseases and stuff like that. The second house here, that was here, uh, Miss Curry, uh, Bess, uh, lived here and she died with uh, cancer. And uh, one of her daughter died with uh, a very young, young age, she died. I don't know what she died with, but it must have been some kind of heart condition. She died, and, uh, and her oldest daughter died with cancer, and they lived right, right here at this house. Okay, and then my mother died here, and uh, she died when I was 14. She had multiple tumors, uh, and she died with cancer, and it was cancerous. And how old was she? I think she was about 40, 44, 42, something like that. Okay, this house right here is where Ralph Long lived. Ralph and Lily Long, uh, my uncle, mm -hmm. they lived here. Uh, he died with prostate cancer and his wife did die with cancer. Uh, what type, I don't know. How about this house here? Now, this house right here is uh, Miss Tramiel, Susie Tramiel. Roy Tramiel, Susie Tramiel, they lived here. Now, Miss Susie had a high level of PCB over in the 300s. In a in a in a system in a blue, and she uh, she she had a real bad that bad, bad diabetic, <clears throat> and uh, she passed away. And also, uh, her mother lived over there, and I believe she died with cancer. Now uh, there was a house here. His name was Wiley, Wiley, and Fanny Pearl. Uh, they lived there, and I think both of them died with cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah, they died with cancer. <clears throat> the extent of Reverend Long's concerns go beyond what has happened to his community in the past into the ongoing cleanup process beginning with his own backyard. Pam Scully, the EPA official who oversees this cleanup, explained the criteria for PCB contaminated soil removal as outlined by the agreement between EPA and Solutia. The consent decree requires that in the top foot we have to have less than one part per million PCBs. Mm -hmm. Below one foot, we have to have less than 10 part per million PCBs. Um, if there is greater than 10 part per million PCBs, we will excavate until we reach 10 part per million PCBs. There are very few properties we've had to dig below one foot. It goes real deep here. Real deep. This part of the back here, 
you see for yourself. I asked Professor David Carpenter, a PCB scientist who testified on behalf of Anderson residents in their lawsuit against Monsanto, why PCB contaminated soil might be found and removed from one part of a backyard, but in another section, just inches away, the soil went untouched. The problem is, of course, that contamination can be quite spotty. It can be very high one place and not so high the next place. Uh, the appropriate way to deal with a backyard of a home that that has high levels at some sites is to excavate the whole backyard uh, and not to pretend that if you take a soil sample that uh, does not show high levels of contamination that any known area around that particular site is equally free of contaminants. So according to Solusha, where I'm standing right now is safe. Yeah. I'm standing right now. I didn't clean up. You like it to me, don't it? According to this document from Solusha, they sampled your backyard and found that there were 16.1 parts per million right here where I'm standing. The level of safety is one part per million. This document was sent December 1st, 2004. They say the samples were collected October 14th, 2004. When was this cleanup completed? Uh, this project was cleaned up uh, in November uh, 2006. So it took them two years to clean up this property? Yes, it took two years. And you said that the reason why it took so long is because you wanted the inside of your house cleaned up as well? Right. That was the condition. And they finally, uh, within the past uh, six months, agreed to, to do that. And so I... According to Reverend Long, even after a two-year delay, when Solusha finally came to clean up the inside of his home, they failed to meet all of their own cleanup guidelines. Solusha was supposed to uh, replace the air filters in your home. They did not replace the air filters. They were supposed to uh, vacuum all the carpets, closet floors, things like that. Did they do that? No. The vacuum machine <laughs> didn't work. So they never did it? That's what they say. They said, we just bought a new one and it don't work. They were going to come back and do it? Nah. I don't know how to run that. They never did? <laughs> no. They, they finished. So did they wipe down the light fixtures and yeah, the ceilings? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they had a little thing on the pole. <laughs> With the dust off of it. They, uh, they, so they never got around to vacuuming the upholstery or anything like that? No. What they did do, they vacuumed the ceiling fans, some of the bookshelves, and they ran a rough mop over the floors and the counter, the counters, surfaces. They wiped them down. During our brief conversation with Reverend Long, his lifelong friend and neighbor, Sylvester Harris, received a phone call. Yeah, I just got a phone call just then that my sister passed in Detroit. And she was born and raised here and went to Detroit with cancer. Just now? Just now. Just the phone I just got through talking. 